Ahí está. Ok, ok, great. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, I'm very lucky with, I don't have to introduce. He'll have questions. Oh. No, no, he'll have questions. We don't have time. He used it plus 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, we will have a question uh, uh, session afterwards. Uh, at the so I'm very lucky because he has been already introduced. So please go yeah. ahead without. Do we have slides? Or? Yes, slides, please. Okay, here we are. So this is basically what I'm going to talk about. It's, this is the normal network as T-cell simulation and antigen presentation. So you normally have a naive T-cell that binds to MHC and an antigen that is presented is activated and then can actually home in onto the um, target cell or tumor cell. Unfortunately, tumors have evolved a mechanism by which they can actually silence these active cells. And the technology that we are using is actually trying to circumvent that. Um, we are using the technology that was developed by um, Carl June and was licensed from the world in 2012. We're using chimeric, uh, chimeric antigen receptor construct that are expressed on the cells, therefore abrogating the need for MHC coactivation. The target that we are looking at at the moment is CD19. It's an ideal tumor target because it's expressed only on lymphatic tissues and not on the hematopoietic stem cells, but only at a bit more mature cells up to the stage of plasma cells. And what is important that CD19 is not only expressed on normal tissue, but mainly also on malignant tissues, such as chronic lymphatic leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and other forms of lymphomas. If you compare it with CD20 expression, which is the current target for immunotherapy, it's a, a broader a spectrum there. This is the design. Um, it, this is almost like an antibody. So we do have the antigen binding domain, which is derived from a murine um, CD19 antibody. The single chain <clears throat> um, variable fragment fused to the intracellular domain by a hinge region. And we are using a so-called second generation card construct because in addition to the CD3 zeta signaling domain that actually activates the cell, we do have a co-stimulatory domain. In our case, it's 41VB. Um, also frequently used as CD28, but uh, there are biological differences in here. This is basically what we're doing. We have a lentiviral vector that codes for the car. The cells then express the car construct, bind tumor cells, and kill the tumor cells. And this is really the acute phase of cell killing. What we see in clinic is really after infusion, a massive proliferation and activation of the infused CAR T cells that then actually are going to home to the tumor, destroy the tumor. But in addition to that, we do observe persistence of the T cells, of the CAR expressing T cells at very low levels. So we do have a long-term immunosurveillance, very similar to a vaccination effect. And you can imagine that bringing something like that to a GMP large-scale manufacturing poses its challenges. This is the production cycle. So after we have identified a patient and um, the patient consented, we are collecting unstimulated leukophoresis, unstimulated white blood cells that are then frozen and shipped to the manufacturing site. Upon arrival there, after quality control, the cells are thawed incubated with antigen, uh, antibody-coated um, magnetic beads. We are using CD3 and CD28, and are transduced by the lentivirus. After further cultivation and expansion of the cells, the beads are then removed. Cells are washed several times to also get rid of any viral supernatants or viral leftovers. And after quality control, um, the cells are then released and frozen and shipped to the sites. So before we infuse the cells, the patients actually are treated with a form of chemotherapy. We call it lymphodepletion chemotherapy. And this is not really to control the cancer, but more to actually allow the T cells to engraft. Um, this has been tested in clinic and is um, under investigation at the moment. We have five trials at the University of 
Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital. Um, and I'm going to uh, present you some data up there. So the indications that we are looking at is acute lymphoblastic leukemia in kids and in adults, chronic lymph lymphocytic leukemia, and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. By now, we have treated over 170 patients, actually, with this. And this is the general trial layout. So most of the trials that we're doing are single, um, single arm trials where we have um, inclusion, then we do have the apheresis, the lymphodepletion chemotherapy, and then the, um, the infusion and response. So for ALL, it's quite interesting. This is pediatric ALL, and see, you can see that we do observe a complete response in 90% of the patients treated. These were patients that were totally refractory to the prior therapies. Many patients also had undergone a um, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. Many of these patients also have complete disappearance on a molecular level of the disease. Interesting, we do see escapes. So seven patients that had achieved a complete remission, the total disappearance of their lymphatic um, blasts from the bone actually relapsed. And three patients did so by downregulating CD19. Pretty easy. If the cells are sticking around, if you have selective pressure for one given antigen, um, the easiest way is just to lose antigen expression and you're safe. We also see kind of relapses that are due to non-optimal product probably, where these cells did not fully expand or did not show its, um, persistence. And there is a correlation of persistence over time and response. Um, also interesting, especially specifically for this indication, is these CTL19 cells are homing to the um, cerebrospinal fluid and therefore are also covering an, um, a biological niche that normally is responsible for a lot of um, relapses over time because in the brain, um, the, the lymphatic blasts are normally protected from chemotherapy. Here, um, we can actually show that patients who had detectable blasts in the CNS were cleared by the therapy. This is the long-term effects, event-free survival and overall survival. Event-free survival here at six months is um, around 70%, and overall survival is around 78%. As a comparison, um, the overall survival in this patient population is between three and six, week, uh, uh, three and six months. So it's, it's really a total change there in the disease. This is updated data, where we now can say that we do have 94% complete response rate, and um, with an even improved um, six-month overall survival, and we are hoping that this actually will plateau out at some point of time, where we see only um, very early relapses, but not late relapses. Well, switching the indication. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia is really a leukemia, so the antigen is readily available, blasts are circulating or are actually populating the bone marrow. It's very different in solid lymphomas. Um, we have data now from diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, which is also quite encouraging. So the first response assessment is done after three months to really be able to tell apart the chemotherapy effect from the cell therapy effect. And what we see is a 50% response rate in patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and a 100% response rate in patients with follicular lymphoma. More importantly, I think, is that over time, patients convert to complete remission. So within six months, most of the patients who actually showed an initial response are in complete remission. Same also for follicular lymphoma. So it needs some time for the cells to really fully do their job. And um, if you're looking at the duration of response here, in green you can see the patients that have ongoing responses. And there's one patient who actually relapsed at months six, and that was the one patient that only achieved a PR. Same pattern also for follicular lymphoma. The one patient that actually did not reach the full complete remission um, relapsed after a year. But a year, I mean, these were highly refractory patients Many patients had received more than four, median was, yeah, whatever, the range was four to, to eight uh, prior lines of therapy, including transplantation. Um, so it's quite impressive. 
again switching indications, chronic lymphatic leukemia. And here you do see a difference. All of a sudden the response rate is only 40%. Well, only 40%. We do see 20% of complete responses that are ongoing over time. And we do see, of course, the same rate of um, partial remission. The interesting thing is that really the molecular phenotype, high risk mutations such as p53 mutation, are actually responding. So we do have long-term survivors now completely disease-free in high-risk populations um, that cannot be cured or really successfully treated with chemotherapy. The overall survival at the last data cutoff was 68% um, at nine months, which is um, quite promising for now. This compares well with other CART constructs that are clinical in, in, in clinical testing at the moment. So I think it's really a, a class effect here. And we do see some biological differences in terms of persistence of the cells and um, overall efficacy. Now, one of the explanations is why we do see um, slightly reduced response rate in con uh, CLL is because we can really tell apart the responders from the non-responders by looking at the expansion profile. And it's highly, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's very simple. In patients where you do actually see persistence of the cells and initial expansion of the cells, you do have anti-tumor effects. In patients where you only have low-level expansion, um, you do not really see a complete full and, and full response. This is the summary um, for all the trials that are ongoing. Again, we have pediatric ALL with a response rate of 49%. We have adult ALL for now, five, uh, five patients treated with a response rate of 100%. In lymphoma, same thing, 50% response rate, 100% um, response rate in follicular lymphoma. And the third lymphoma indication where we don't have data at the moment to present is really mental cell lymphoma, another form of aggressive lymphoma, but these patients actually have not reached their um, first assessment. In chronic lymphatic leukemia, again, a response rate of 42%. Well, the therapy doesn't come without costs and without complications, and we do have life-threatening complications. Um, first of all, it's the cytokine release syndrome. It's a cytokine storm because of uncontrolled or hyperactivation of the T cells and release of a whole slew of cytokines. This is characterized by fever, hypertension, neurological changes, up to multi-organ failure and as a life-threatening complication. This is not specific to CTL-19, but has been described for all CAR T-cell therapies and all CD-19 targeting therapies. Again, we do have B-cell aplasia, something you can easily imagine because B-cells are CD-19 positive. So if you kill or remove B-cells and, and CD-19 positive cells, you will also expect B-cell aplasia that is ongoing as long as you have circulating CTL-19 cells. And as for any effective anti-tumor treatment, you observe tumor lysis syndrome, specifically in patients that have a high tumor load. This is something that is not really a clinical challenge, but is something that you can control by prophylactic measurements. Because of the incidence of CRS and the life-threatening nature of this um, complication, we developed a um, treatment algorithm for CRS. And as you can see, here, patients with um, ALL have a higher rate of CRS as patients with solid lymphomas, and patients with adult um, ALL have a higher degree of CRS um, than, than pediatric patients. CRS also correlates with um, the disease burden, at least in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Well, analyzing the cytokines that were released IL-6 and interleukin-6 stood out as one of the druggable targets. So um, the colleagues at Penn actually, while treating a patient that was really sick, discovered that we do have um, um, antibody against IL-6 receptor, tocilizumab, and used that. And interestingly, as soon as they infused the patient, the fever went down, and the CRS resolved within 24 hours. And the patient that was almost dying so it's a highly specific and, and, and effective treatment in most of the patients. Steroids can be used, but again, steroids are lymphotoxic, so they will also kill the um, lymphocytes. 
what, quite different from normal drug development, where you follow your patients for two half times of the, um, of the drug at, study end, uh, at, at end of study, we are actually following the patient for 15 years after the last infusion. This is based on regulatory requirements as we are applying a gene-modified organism, um, so to speak. And um, this is something that makes that really different. We are following up on the long-term efficacy and long-term, of course, safety and any delayed adverse event that we could expect. So in conclusion, the investigational therapy with um, CAR-modified T cells directed against CTL19 or, uh, sorry, CD19 can induce durable emissions and lasting responses in highly refractory um, B cell malignancies. The toxicity, if carefully monitored, is manageable and I think acceptable for this patient population. And therefore, we are now launching several registration trials and new indications. Thank you. <laughs>